Hey everyone, I just want to start off today's video with a quick anecdote. When I was around 18, I was looking for a reliable and good used car, and I noticed an ad for someone selling a Plymouth Sapporo. Never heard of it, you say? Well, probably for good reason. What I loved about this car was that it was a total unicorn in a sea of Honda Civics. Somehow, I really connected with the look and the feel of this car, and no amount of logic went into this purchase, because logic would have told me to buy the Honda Civic. Introducing the Sigma FPL. This is the Plymouth Sapporo of mirrorless cameras. Now, you should know that there's already a lot of really great reviews online about this camera, and if you're seriously interested in it, you should probably watch those, so I've linked to a couple of those in the description below. But this video focuses on the one or two key reasons why I think anyone would want to use or own this camera. You should also know that, uh, as far as an imaging brand is concerned, I absolutely adore Sigma. In fact, I've used their cinema full frame glass on more film projects than I can count. Really love their optics. But they have a history in the last decade of making rather puzzling cameras, well, at least for the Western market. When I had visited Japan a couple years ago, I was absolutely floored at how many different Sigma cameras there were that I had never seen before. Like the hockey stick shaped DP3 camera or the bizarrely shaped SD Quattro H. By comparison, the FP line seems rather remarkably conservative and mainstream. That is to say that sometimes you don't buy or use things that make sense globally, but more that they make sense to you specifically. I get what Sigma is trying to do here, but their biggest angle on this camera is it's the world's smallest full frame camera. And as Gerald Undone pointed out, small to a fault for two reasons. One is that the camera size actually handicaps it. The screen doesn't tilt and it could use a few more buttons. But more importantly, what good is a small body when all you're using is interchangeable lenses? And once the lens is on, I implore you to show me how this is any less packable than the a7R 4 that I have here. So why buy this camera? For all its eccentricities, it is still a 61 megapixel full frame camera and produces images that are as good as any modern 61 megapixel full frame camera would be. It's certainly not hindered in image quality in any way, though it does suffer from not having a mechanical shutter like the a7R 4 however. Now, if you hold this camera up to an a7R 4 while the a7R 4 has this camera beat in basically every single way except for a few things. Now, to explain that further, let's look at a couple pictures. Here is Orson Welles holding something to his face on the set of Citizen Kane. And here is Roger Deakins doing the same on likely some sort of Oscar-nominated film. What they're holding are director's viewfinders. And these puppies aren't cheap despite their simplicity. They'll land you anywhere from five to 15,000 euros for some ground glass and a handle. The core reason to use a director's viewfinder is to work out shots on set without having to move your entire huge camera rig. And so they're indispensable on sort of large productions that move very, very quickly. Um, now, the great thing about the FP and the FPL is that they have a director's viewfinder feature built in, and we're gonna get into the details of that momentarily. Uh, but what's additionally great about using the FP as a director's viewfinder is with the regular gl ground glass ones, you can't record an image and you can't take a photo in any way. So there's no way to archive what you're seeing. And in pre-production, being able to go to your location and take some shots or take some videos is a huge part of the planning process in filmmaking. And now being able to go to set with the lenses you actually plan to shoot with and then archive that and be able to share that with your team in the pre-production process is another huge part of the filmmaking puzzle. And to be able to do that for fractions of the cost of what an actual ground glass viewfinder is, uh, is pretty remarkable. Another nice thing that this camera has is a waveform monitor and shutter angle. And those are two very important tools for a cinematographer. And lastly, when you're not using this as a filmmaking tool, what you can do is you can probably pop a small little lens on here and a nice lanyard and just keep it around you on set to take some production stills or some BTS stills like I did a couple weeks ago. The argument has already been made in other videos that if this is the only reason you're buying this camera, then you'd be better off with the lower resolution FP and a cost savings of around $1,000. And I don't disagree. Though if you're attracted by the idea of 61 megapixels and the massive amount of recropping that it can give you, then the L is really the only game in town. And I assure you this isn't a gimmick. A number of large rental houses here in Toronto have been buying the FP specifically to rent out to directors as viewfinders. It is an indispensable tool on any film set. So let me take you through what the camera offers in this respect. Going into the menu, we have three custom settings to choose from. And within that, you can choose from three different camera brands. Right now, the only cameras available are the premium cinema cameras. I'd like to see them expand this list out a little bit in future firmware, especially since under the red category, you get every DSMC2 model and the Komodo, but under Sony, you only get the Venice. Once you select your camera, you can select your sensor crop or de-squeeze for anamorphic lenses. 
Then you can back out and go into your aspect ratio crop if needed. In this setting, you can also make custom mats for whatever frame dimension your heart desires. In this very specific way, this camera can do what no other mirrorless camera can and can absolutely be an important tool for professional filmmakers. If you want to set this camera up like a real director's viewfinder, then you will likely want to get the Sigma LCD viewfinder LVF-11. In terms of lens adapters, there are many on the market, but I recommend the L to PL mount adapter for Metabones. It's well made and it's a very good price. However, you could skip the LVF-11 and just buy the EVF-11 for an extra $600 Canadian. What's great about the EVF-11 is that I've never seen any other 35 millimeter camera do this, which has got a flip up eyepiece. And I found myself actually shooting with it like this quite a lot and loving it. It's really great. Although, you know, keep in mind that it's going to let in a whole lot more light than the LVF-11 would. So, you know, choose your viewfinder accordingly, depending on how you see yourself using the camera. And my final reason for recommending this camera is that sometimes defying all logic, we just connect with a particular design. Art is heart. And some things just feel right, even though they don't make a whole lot of logical sense. And if this camera is for you, then this is your Plymouth Sapporo. And that's it for me. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this was informative. As always, please subscribe to this channel for more videos like this and comment in the comment section below. I genuinely want to know what you think of Sigma cameras because they puzzle me a little bit. And that's it. Thanks so much for watching. Peace.